Roll it. Got it. Okay. Welcome to the the start of the build. So we're going to talk about how do we build a 3D printer in one day. Not only one, but we're going to build 18 people. 18. That's good. That's the biggest number yet, and to do that requires good coordination. We've got pretty good documentation. There's parts that are actually from projects that we borrow, like the hot end comes from E3D, which is an open so actually a fully open source design. The extruder itself, we borrowed and modified the one that's on the Prusa i3 printer. And the rest is fully our design, which is the universal axis, which is fully documented. And there's some main points about workflow that we just have to go over to make this flow smoothly. So let's recording. So the way it works well is that when all of us are looking at a machine in a particular direction, so that when you look at your own machine, you have the exact same picture in your mind. And uh, that simply helps things. Because say like, you're to flip it over, the orientations of things matter, like, for example, first of all, the frame is a cube, three equal sides, to begin with. 16, 14, 13 inch, inch builds, why? So, in order to do no waste on the metal cutting, you can do nested cutouts. So, you, you cut out the outer one, which is 16 inches. You have a four by eight foot sheet that's standard in America. Question? No, why, sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, 16 inches is 48 divided by 3, so you can fit three of them on a 48 inch sheet. Now it actually turns out you can't do that because they need a little bit of room on the edge in order to cut. So that was actually cut from a 5 by 10 sheet, which I learned. So, so what we could do, for example, is do like 15 and a half, and that would fit three across a 4 by 8 sheet, because a 4 by 8 sheet, 32 square feet, is going to be less than like 5 by 10, which is 50 square feet by like a third or so, so you want to work with a 4 by 8 But here we, we, we have the 16 inch. So the, the width of the frame there is like 1 inch. So we have nested frames that are 1 inch thick. And that's plenty of strength because we're in steel. It's a space structure, so it's, it's a three-dimensional space frame structure, which is very strong. It doesn't suffer from some of the weakness issues or stability issues that maybe other designs do. Because like space frames in, in space too, like lattice-like lattice, lattice -like structures, they're very strong. If they're supported in XYZ, they're very strong. So let's take a look at it. When we're looking at it from the front, first of all, we define the back, the front, left, and right. <coughs> we have the, the x-axis, which moves back and forth. So this machine is basically a, a moving 3D printer head uh, in three dimensions. So we have, somehow you have to accommodate three dimensions. Two of those dimensions are in the top part, which is the X and Y. And the third axis is the Z axis, means the whole bed moves up and down using uh, the universal axis system. So this is what it looks like when you're looking at it from the front. Control, so that there's an electronic panel on your left hand side. You look at where the motor, so that's the X axis, moves back and forth. Y moves in and out, right, left, front, back. The important parts are that the <clears throat> orientation matters, like whether the motor is here or there, it kind of matters because geometrically you might, like for example, you have components like end stops, it just needs to be that way, otherwise things won't work. So that motor right there is facing towards us, that's another detail. So it's on the left hand side facing towards us. The Y motors are on the outside, on the back side. The Z motors are on the top both front and back. There's the bed that's, that's also on the same rods, the same kind of rods here to support the bed. So the main parts are your frame, a set of axes, a heat bed, electronics control, that's the whole electrical panel, which we mount on a piece of plexiglass. We just drill holes with a cordless drill. After we build the laser cutter, uh, we can cut that whole thing, all the little holes, with the laser cutter. There's the cable chain, which is the cable routing. That's like the final part after everything is working. Cable routing, so it's nice. You got one cable chain there, so it's all the wires. All those wires are going inside there. And all the wires from this, because these things are moving around. You can't rip, if, if you didn't have that, you'd rip up the wires after some time. So you got the cable chains. 
Uh, one thing we, we're not really showing here is the spool for filament. Um, what we can do there is actually extend another rod, put another rod in through the top. So there'll be, and then on this axis and the other one, so basically two vertical and then like that, and you put your spool, just hang your spool on that. Interestingly, the way this is designed, the, the rod goes all the way up to there. There's an inch left, so you can actually put another rod for your, for your holder, your spool holder. In this case, the magical uh, holder is it's hanging from the ceiling. You got a low ceiling, or you, you got a wood beam, like you know, like that beam you can put a bunch of printers underneath them. Just as, I just suspended on fence wire on the ceiling in this case. Okay, so orientation. Going back to the other, other one. So this this is the summary. That's the just the concept, where the motors are. The 13 inch version, since it's a small, smaller frame, that 3D printer will have a seven by eight workable area. The other ones have eight by eight workable area. Um, they all take the eight inch bed. The good thing about the scalability part is once you have one of these 3D printers, you can print of course, its own parts for the axes, and the rest of everything is easy to source off the shelf Amazon parts. So it makes it very easy to replicate it. No, I mean, there's no special parts at all in this by design because we want access for everybody to be able to do this, which, which is interesting in the case that we're actually trying to run an enterprise based on this while not using any parts. So it's like, you, you know, you could be afraid that somebody's going to rip you off. Wow. No. Don't worry about that. That's, uh, but that's one of the features. We make it easy for anyone to copy this. And um, I think because of the, the modularity part and the scalability part, I think that this will become like the dominant player in the, in the marketplace when people, when people absorb it all over the world. I think simply because of the, the flexibility. I mean, you can't beat that flexibility. Um, you know, companies do, like when there's a 3D printer company, they typically have just a 3D printer. For us, we have so many of the other products in the whole product line because of the flexibility. So I do, I do have high hopes for the, the, the way that this can be replicated around the world easier than anyone else else's. The other thing that's actually one, one important part, part count, unique part count. We are about one third, one half to one third of the part count of any other printer, the unique part count. So that's also mean, means that you can build it very fast. Um, other printers, like when they say you build it in five hours, they're not saying, like for example, I made 3D, that you can build that in five hours. But that's a lot of prepared parts, parts that are really highly finished already. Uh, for us, we're talking about five hours and literally from, from scratch, from things you get from Amazon, from a master car, eBay, and so forth. Uh, the simplicity, design for simplicity is it here. The universal axis is identical for X, Y, and Z. The rods for the bed, they're the same rods as, the, as all the other axes. Same stepper motors. So essentially, if you know how to build one axis, you know how to build three axes, or more axes, or however many you want. And that's the beauty of it. Um, but this kind of orientation, we will, will have the machine up there. So all you need to know is that, yes, orientation does matter because things may not end up working. There's some things that will simply not work, and other things that, yeah, they, they could work, but uh, your machine would look different or something. But mostly, yeah, just keep, keep to this convention. Most of the things, you have to make it like that so it works, meaning you can travel the, across the whole area. Like, for example, if you, if you flip the extruder, not, you know, it's, it's facing, say, towards us. Um, let's look at the extruder, for example. And just to give you one example of how things matter. Do I have that? I must have that somewhere else here. Like, for example, you don't see the extruder. The extruder is on the other side. Uh, if you 
faced it this way, then if you build the machine as is here, you would miss out all that chunk of the, the bed on that far side. You wouldn't be able to get, get to it, for example. So you just need to build everything as is. And you'll have this exact model there. We'll have it that you can copy exactly. There's no differences between what we're going to build, except that we're going to use 16, 14, and 13 inch frames. For the 13 inch frame, what we're going to do here is use another one of these and mount it here so we get an extra inch. Same rods and everything. We'll get an extra inch here by mounting one of these so that the axis actually goes right on top of that. And therefore, that means that the frame is a little smaller, but the area in the x direction that you can travel is still the same. Um, so orientation matters. OK. So let's talk about the frames. We have six frames already that we have that are 13 inch from, from those are from last year. And we're welding up more of these. So Matt's going to take care of that crew. How many welders do we have available? We've got four. Uh, four? I, I didn't try to hire a great one. OK. I've welded here before, and that's about it. Would you like to do it? Sure. Uh, so what the welding is, is kind of like this here, basically like four tacks, so like a little zap. Uh, so people who have welded before, I think we could do that, otherwise, uh, maybe not right now, because we have to do everything in parallel, and there's plenty of tasks for everybody. Um, and maybe like if we do the second build, maybe people, if they really insist on welding, we can teach you the basics a little bit, because we'll do the, the two 3D printers as well as the as we said, the laser cutter. So, okay, so step one is tack welding. And that will take care of that. So basically you're just, just pretty much dots that are like a quarter inch long or something uh, across four, four places everywhere. Uh, one frame like this takes about 15 minutes if you're going at it, if you know what you're doing. Um, orientation of holes. These are, what are those holes? Those are the, the people see what the, those holes are? Those are where the axes are mounted. How do you mount the axes? Before we used to do a magnetic mount, people hated it because the magnets are strong, and they jump out, it's hard to put them on. So what we do for magnets, we're gonna use just one on, a, on the tool mount. The way you do it is you get a metal plate, put the magnets on the metal plate, and then put your plastic piece on it. With, so you dab a little crazy glue on the magnets, put the plastic on. If you try to do it the other way around, you got the plastic, you put the magnets in there, they're just gonna jump. You're not gonna keep them in there. So you have to attach, the, attach them. I'll show that. I'll show that in the workshop and we'll get a good video because that's a good, good instructional. We're not using the magnets on the, on the axes because that's actually, it takes a little longer and people hated it. <laughs> so we're just doing a single bolt hole, quarter inch. Uh, the frame pieces just get a bolt through it, like a 30 millimeter bolt. Those are the holes, so when we do the frames, just, just for reference for everybody, these are the mounting points for the z-axis, these are the mounting points for the y-axis. Does that make sense? Uh, because for whoever did, didn't make sense, if the z-axis is here in the front, or better yet, uh, let's look at the real picture. That one hole there, you see that? That's going through the frame. It's going through the plastic piece and through the frame. So that the universal axis is designed so it can be mounted magnetically or through hole like that, or it's got another hole, a little nut catcher where you put in a quarter inch nut, and then you can actually screw in a bolt there so you can attach a plane to there. That's how we attach the X to the Y. The X has a nut, little nut inside of it, so you bolt it through the Y on the other side. We'll, we'll get more into that details. But the point, the relevant point is, there's going to be a hole there through the frame, hole there through the frame. So when you're welding it up, make sure you don't put like the frame piece that's got the holes like on the side, for example. Because there's a unique part count of three on the frame. One is the plain, uh, just the plain, uh, plain square, no holes. One has the two holes in the middle for the Z, and the other one has the two holes for the Ys, and they're in different locations. This one's in the middle of, of it. These ones are on the ends, because the axis is attached at the ends. 
So using this method, you can attach, you can make any size frame, you can attach things, you can do like multiple axes, like you can do like one above the other if you want more strength for it to be a larger machine. Uh, I think with this, the way it is right now, you can possibly get up to like three feet, which is what we're going to do. We're going to try our machine on, on the last day as a, uh, s just a single one. If we see that it's just bending too much and it's not working, we're going to have to fix it. But even if it bends, not necessarily a bad thing because we have automatic bed leveling. So think about this. Would this work? You tell me. You got a probe there on a on an extruder. So that's the that's the extruder. You see a little slip of uh, plastic coming out of it. It's got a high probe that detects the metal. There's a metal uh, aluminum plate with a high performance plastic cover on it. It's called PEI, a complex chemical name. It works such as, like when you heat it up, the prints stick to it. When it cools off, they come right off. It's really nice. Otherwise, you'd have to be fighting trying to get your print off the bed. Um, if you use glass or something else, or if you use like painter's tape people use, that's doable. I mean, painter's tape works well. You don't need to heat the bed. Uh, but it's, it could be, if you have a big flat surface, good luck trying to get that off. You're going to use a lot of force. You're going to rip the tape off, and you're going to have to put the tape on again. Uh, here, when it cools off, it comes right off the bed. Very nice. Okay, if you have a, what's the limit of scalability here? What if you have a super long axis and it drooped down by an inch? Would that still work? Well, let's think about it. So that detector is making the, the bed go up and down based on where the level of that, of the head is. So if that thing is drooping, I mean, obviously it's going to be lower in the middle and higher on the ends, but the bed is adjusting for that. So even if you have a massive droop, it's not going to matter in principle. So, for which reason, <laughs> we can try that on the last day, day number seven. We can try the, the droopy axis, because if you get to three feet, you might see a visible, maybe, I'm not sure. It, it might, you might not even see it, it's going to be so minor. So we should definitely try it. And if you have any issues with that, like we see that it's just messing up for some reason, we could double up the axes. You can stack like two of them together, we might want to stack like two vertically one under each other, you can do both. And um, I don't know, I would say probably stacking one piggyback to each other is probably easier. Because if you do that, you need another bolt hole set, you know. We could probably try it too. But the point is that you can you can scale this. And this is the these rods are eight millimeters. Once once again you can make them larger. And our goal is actually to do up to three inch no two inch rods at least. You might do three. With 3D printed plastic pieces around just like that so you get a high performance axis at the cost of scrap plastic and metal rod. Metal is a dollar a pound. So a shaft, three inch shaft costs like 20 bucks a foot, 20 maybe 30 bucks a foot. It gets expensive for a big machine but then you're talking about like yeah heavy duty CNC milling and those machines run a lot of money. So we can do it low cost. Okay. Uh, so that's the orientation of the frame. That's, I think that's about all we need to say about the frame for your full understanding of it. All right, so we said that there's three steps, tack and weld, grind it. We might want to grind like if there's spatter or just uh, some rough spots. We can gr grind some unevenness and spatter or like if the bead got really sharp or whatever. And last step is paint, so just regular spray paint. We can do that so it's black, like the black beauty in the other picture there. Okay, so this is what the universal axis looks like. And so we're going to work in parallel on the, on the frames and on the axes. And what we want to do as soon as the frames are ready, we want to start mounting the axes. We don't want to wait till we build all the axes in case we have something wrong. So as soon as we build the first axis, ideally we have a frame to mount it to. We already have six frames. On the six frames that we do have, they do not have holes. We've got to take a, a regular drill to that. And we can take a look at the bolt hole locations. The bolt hole locations, uh, the ration, right. No. What are the bolt hole locations for the y-axis? For the z, it's going to be about in the middle. We can copy, for all of the frames, we can copy or use the model to, to model from, to, to find a bolt hole location. Now here, it's the top bolt, you don't see it from the side here, but it's the top bolt going through the frame. 
How far is it from the top? Well, just enough so that the rods are below that, below the top metal. So it's like a couple of inches down. The ball hole is about right there. Uh, so we're going to just, just measure it off the machine. Um, we should have that number. I don't know. We can just take a look at the machine. But someone, we could do probably like the person on the drilling that's, because there's many other tasks. Each axis, so the X axis has the, has the tool mounted on it. So we can do the magnetic things we want to do first because the glue takes like a few seconds, not too long, like a minute or two. But it's good to do the magnetic mount so we're ready for the extruder later. Um, I'll show you that. I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate all of that in the shop. This is just theory here. So make the carriages. The carriage is this piece right here. That's the motor piece. That's the idler piece. This is actually the original axis. The idler piece we shrunk to, down to half of that, so it's f twice as fast to print. And you just don't need the plastic there. That's just holding the rods. And there's a little bearing in there, inside there. But we have this piece that's, that's half, the, half the short. At the size, it's the idler piece. <clears throat> So make the carriages first, they're the easiest. You put four bearings in there, the linear bearings, so the shafts uh, slide on those bearings. Now we're gonna use plastic bearings. Here's the deal. We use the metal bearings, and then we push the machine to the limits, and it turns out that, it, so we're running, like we're optimizing the speed and running at like 400% of, sta 400 of standard speed. So we're really beefing it up. Uh, we found that if you don't, well, the, the rods get scratched uh, if you don't do that using the rods that we have. We have eight millimeter rods. They're actually not the chrome rods. They're regular eight millimeter rods from McMaster Carr. Uh, we had other rods get scratched with the metal bearings when going super fast. Okay, so that was the result I found out just like three weeks ago, because uh, we're trying to push the speed. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use plastic bearings. They're this glide plastic type thing, actually more expensive. They're supposed to be better. They're actually very quiet. With the, with the metal ball bearings, these linear bearings, they make a lot of noise, actually. So it's, it's better for noise, it's quieter, and it should last forever. That's not going to eat up, plastic is not going to eat up the rods. Therefore, we're actually able to use lower cost rods instead of the hard chrome rods. Um, because, uh, like, I, I get them from a master car, and they don't have the, the chrome rods in 8 millimeters. They have them in 5 sixteenths because we're in America. <laughs> so for the American scenario, it's harder to get 8 millimeter rods, but you do get 8 millimeter rods in this so-called 1214L steel, which is this ultra-machinable steel, uh, but it would get eaten up if we run fast. If we go slow, we're fine, but we want to push the limits of this. So we've got these plastic bearings. The way it works then, okay, so make carriages. That's the carriage. The pegs go later. They hold the belt. I'll show you that mechanism. It's pretty cool. Uh, mount pulleys at motors. So the motor, we take them and uh, just put the pulley on that, and there's a little set screw. I'll demonstrate. After you have the motor on that, uh, the, the pulley on the motor, you can uh, make this motor piece. All these pieces basically have like these four, four of these six millimeter bolts through them with a nut on the other side. Uh, we're going to have cordless drills. We cut up some of the Allen wrenches so we can put an Allen wrench into the cordless drill to, to use it as a power drill on the lowest setting. Otherwise, you'd break the plastic. We'll show that. Uh, but yeah, basically all these get the, get the bolts through them. This one definitely has the middle one. That one, the middle is not important because there's nothing there. On this one, there's an idler. There's a little pull, pulley idler there, a little bearing thing in there. So we made the motor piece, made the idler piece, cut the belts. The formula for the belts is 2x plus 2. Length of the thing, which is 14, 16, or 13. So it takes, take twice that plus 2. So for 16, it's going to be 34. 16 times 2 plus 2. For 13, it's going to be, what, 28. So we need three different belt lengths. Uh, that's, that's the formula that works. Slip rods into the idler piece. So put the rods in there and tighten it down. That's the part we're not going to adjust. We're going to adjust that side later because we're going to have to have an exact fit. So you can clamp down one part and keep that loose. Just don't tighten all the bolts down. We'll see later. So after you slip the rods into the idle piece, fix it, then mount the other piece. So slip on the, the, the carriage and the motor piece. Make the whole axis, just keep the motor piece loose. 
and this one's already loose, that's a sliding thing. Insert the belt, and then insert the pegs loosely just to keep in. So that's what we gotta do. The belt, the, the axis, and the frames. If we can do that uh, in the next near while, then we'll be good. Uh, we'll talk about the rest of the machine later, but that's, uh, so what we gotta do now is bring, I gotta bring down the machine to the shop. Uh, let's see, how, how do we wanna organize? Who wants to weld? Who's welded before? Kyle? Anyone else welded? I've welded before, but I'm not, Sam, I'm really great at it. <laughs> We're only doing tacks anyway. Yeah, I can, I can. Let's do it. Let's have you and three of you guys. I can, I can I know um, you want to teach somebody right now, or is it going to take time? It won't take long. Okay, four of you guys. Okay. Uh, the reason is we want to get the frames up as soon as possible because we want to mount the first axis we make. We mount it right to the right to the frame. We're going to work one by one so that we verify, like you can see it, I can quality control it, we'll all be down the row, it'll be obvious whether it's right or wrong. Like maybe your rods are too long, the bolt is in the wrong place, you'll shake all that down without going further. So that for the next one you build, you'll get it right, so it's a self-verification mechanism. That's it, any questions? Four people on welding, the roll division on the other ones. Uh, we can get people immediately on Make carriages, mount pulley and motors, make motor piece, well, these two, two and three, five, six. Those we can get a lot of people on. So let's go down there and just get masses of people on that. We'll, we'll get the machine down um, so that by that time, you know, you're working on these. Yeah, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time. But this is the universal axis, and uh, it's pretty simple. So, Andre, when we built the the CNC circuit mill, identical axes. We had more of them because we had we needed more strength, and um, but the design is the same. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Yes. How uh, please. Uh, adding multiple axes make it stronger. Uh, because you have more axis mass holding the same weight. So so you're gonna like for example if you have the extruder which is pretty heavy, two axes will make it. <clears throat> will make it supported better. That's not a ridiculous question because you would say that, well, this already has its own weight. What are you adding by adding more axes? Well, you're supporting another part that's more heavy. Yeah. And then, does that answer that? Yeah. And then in, in FreeCAD, there's a workbench called finite element analysis where you can just actually do that. You can see, okay, if I have one, one set of rods, one set of axes versus two, you can actually say, okay, push, push down on that. How far will it deflect? That is something we as amateurs can do like right now because that functionality exists in FreeCAD. Yeah. Uh, more questions? What, what, is, what is the magnets for functioning? Uh, sorry, say again? The magnets, what do they do functionally? Functionally, the magnets are going to hold the, the head, the print head is magnet, magnetically attached. So you can remove it, you can put on another head such as a laser. So it's a, quick, a method of quick exchange. You just take it right off. It'll be like, you know, 10, 20, 20 pounds or so. You got to just need some force. It has to be strong enough so when it's moving around, and could be moving around pretty fast, it doesn't fall off. That's about 10, 20 pounds or so. Yeah. Um, and before, as you see the artifact of the bolt holes, they're still valid. I mean, you can still put magnets on it, and if you want to make a refrigerator holder, you can do that. Um, but that, the strength on those magnets, they're each about eight pounds against metal. So if you, you know, two, four, six, seven times eight, like 50, 60 pounds of hold, that's plenty to hold this axis against the frame, if you got a metal frame. So. Uh, but we're just using the bolt for. It's also, I mean, it's more, it's definitely more secure. Because the trick is, if you don't get the magnets flat, if they're like, you know, a little bent on an angle, they're not going to have the full force. Or if you get dirt under the magnet, you're not going to have full force. So you got to be more careful about it. Yeah. Other questions, sir? I'm wondering about the control panel. Is that not yet? Like, not for now. Okay. We'll do it after. There's plenty here. Yeah. 
We'll do it in the afternoon session. Yeah. You're Alex. saying there's like 20 pounds of uh, pressure needed to put on to remove the head. Have you noticed any like deformation to the axis carriage itself whenever you like, put that much pressure on it? Did they come out unaligned? What's the question? Like uh, whenever you're removing the, yeah. the head, yeah. does it damage the compartment uh, components that it's attached to? Like, no. Uh, so you got to twist it. You don't want to pulling it off like that would would not be good. You probably won't do it. You got to twist it or like lift it that way, like hinge it. Okay. It's it's strong. It's good. Yeah. I think the last time I was here for the workshop, the biggest issue was if the glue wasn't. If you glue it right, you're not going right. to have any problems. But some of the magnets were coming out because right. there's inadequate gluing. Right. So we're, the biggest challenge right now is uh, getting the right amount of dab of glue on the magnets because if you put too much, it takes a long, long time to uh -huh. dry. If you put too little, the magnet's going to come off the, the plastic. So, and now this time, the, the print quality is better than last time, so we should that those issues should be addressed. More questions? Notice the angle piece here. Yeah, the other piece lets the belt ride on it. It's a bearing inside there, and so you need another attachment point for the, the belt. The belt pulls on, on the carriage. Depending on where the peg is, that side or that side, a motor spinning in one direction will move it one way or the other. And we're not going to even worry about that because we found that nobody can do that in practice. There's too many things to keep track, so we're not paying attention to the location of the peg being in that hole versus that hole. It can only go in one hole, but it will go here. You don't worry about it being this way versus 180 degrees. Because what we do in electronics, if that's flipped, then you flip the plug the other way. It's easier to flip a plug than to flip that. So that's actually a lesson from that time. We, what we did last time was, well, one of the early workshops is we were flipping this because we said, okay, let's not mess with electronics because we'll never figure it out. Well, in practice, it's much easier to flip a plug because you can see that move differently. Here, to take it apart will take you much longer than switching a plug in and out. So it's, it's a matter of practice. And in practice, because I mean, there's like five axes, and you've got so many moving parts here, you're, you, know, you think about all these things, it's actually very difficult for humans to get, even if you're looking at the right machine there, it's actually difficult to put it together that it's identical. In the first workshop, we had one, one person out of 12 copy the machine exactly. Those are just the, the results we have. And we're not talking like dumb people. We're, we're saying that there's a lot of, lot of things you have to keep in mind. Yeah. But we can fix the orientation issues there. But the geometry issues we can't fix. We can't fix the, the, uh, the, the direction of the motion that's there. But everything else should stay the same. Yep. More questions? Let's go down there. What we'll do is we'll we'll do a we'll do a brief introduction to the build when we're down there so we'll record all that for good instructions. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>